three reasons why the New Testament its portrayal of Jesus is true, and then I have three other points why any given Christ myth theory is not. Firstly, um, this will be contested, but these this is the place I argue from, so I'm putting cards on the table, as it were. The New Testament documents contain within themselves all the necessary qualifications to satisfy the requirements for not just historicity, but what I'm going to call historicity plus. Now, obviously... Richard Carrier and others like him would say, look, I've got a whole list of contradictions and uh, you've got the wrong genre and all kinds of things. I understand that. It's not as if I'm unaware of those. And even the things I'm about to name as sort of little points is why I proceed from that. I understand there's something to say in each of those. However, this is the place from which I proceed. Um, such as multiple attestation. None of these do it alone, but these are some things that I would say are important. Reliable eyewitness accounts. Obviously, again, I know. But I know that a lot of times when you debate, you do a good job of giving book re- references. Let me give one for that, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by Richard Balcom. Uh, trustworthy sources, um, a reason to be truthful. I would say that Christians uh, have an ethical and even in a certain sense sort of political in a sense of uh, their life, and even religious, if they're formerly religious Jews, reasons to be truthful about what they're talking about. Options for falsifiability. The New Testament has within itself what you might call testable claims written close to the events they portray. And again, I'm not saying that alone makes them true. For example, I know that you write uh, in Proving History, Herodotus reports without a hint of doubt that just a generation or two before he wrote, the Temple of Delphi magically defended itself with animated armaments, lightning bolts, and collapsing cliffs. So I understand it's not just being written close to the events they portray. Internal congruence, so an internal consistency related to that a thematic unity, a coherent narrative. Jesus is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And again, I'm going to be theological, meaning that God doesn't lie. He promises the Messiah will come. Uh, Jesus is the the fulfillment of said promise, for an example. And there's also secondary considerations. These are secondary, so these are not really the ones I consider debating. First and foremost, artistic merit, a diverse, even universal appeal, a staying power, and even a transformative nature. Here's what I'm saying. The real way to discover who Jesus Christ is is by reading the Gospels as they were meant to be read, trustworthy, definitive accounts of the person and work of Jesus. Uh, of course, I would say read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but if you want sort of a scholarly put-together type book, I would read Box, Jesus According to the Scriptures. Secondly, why um, the New Testament portrayal of Jesus is true is the antithesis of it will equal historical chaos. Here's what I mean by that. If you deny the trustworthiness of the New Testament documents and the presentation of Jesus, it'll result in a kind of historical chaos and anarchy in a sense, confusion about history, confusion about its text. And it's really corrosive towards proper historical and hermeneutical controls. For example, let me give one example of that from your book, uh, Richard, um, where you talk about the woman with the alabaster jar in Mark 14. And you say on page 452, there's no historically intelligible reason, that's a, that's a quote, why she would anoint Jesus with this precious oil from the pre- pr- priceless jar. And... Uh, And then you go on to say that Mark's probably got some allegorical reasons, and we could do this with the whole book of Mark and indeed all the Gospels as their historical allegories. However, I looked this up, and I found out that there was an ancient Near Eastern custom. I mean, I've got – I brought some of the books in in my little bag here that show this Mm – to do this type of thing for dinner guests. Not only that, there's a Hebrew precedent. Uh, They would anoint kings, and the Messiah is said to be the anointed one. Uh, Even the Egyptians would give a little dab, it seems, to guests on the tip of their forehead or run down. They would smell good during dinner, meaning there's a bunch of reasons. To say no historically intelligible reason why she would do this, it it seems like – when we don't take it as it is, we, we end up with bad exegesis because you say it's out of his literary imagination. Then you say that even though Jesus says that her deed will be remembered, that Mark doesn't even name her. And so she doesn't really get remembered. But first of all, Jesus said the deed, not the woman's name. But in the other synoptic accounts, she is named Mary of Bethany. You say there's really just symbolic meaning to this. Mark does not really mean this actually happened. But remember this, that. Uh, there's so many historical details that that add up. You say this. Why would they be carrying around an $18,000 pot of oil, much less smash it over someone's head? It doesn't say she smashed it over his head. It says she broke it open 
poured something on his head. It doesn't say she smashed the jar over his head. It just seems like you're trying to make the account sound ridiculous. And then you also ask kind of like, why use it all at once? Well, I looked into that. It seems that you'd have to break them because they were tightly sealed. And it was the kind of thing with a lot of these you'd have to use all at once. And alabaster, you say that that's symbolic. Pliny the Elder says that alabaster is is the best type or alabaster is best for storing perfumes. I've got the, the sources on that. And there's actually more I could say about that. But what I'm trying to show is when we don't take them as they are, end up with we end up with chaos and the way we interpret the events, and it just doesn't work. Thirdly, there are multiple non-biblical sources that corroborate the New Testament outline of the life of Jesus. Now, I go to these second. I view these as inferior sources to the Gospels. They're further away. They say less, yada, yada. But they do corroborate the general outline. Now, I know all these are contested. Uh, what I mean is contested by Christ mythicists. But, for example, Josephus. We talk about the, the, the TF in there, and the question is, is that authentic? Some of it, yes, no. Everyone knows it's been monkeyed with a little bit because it's got things that Josephus, as a non-Christian Jew, could never believe. However, does that mean the whole thing's an interpolation? And I know you know this. I've heard you talk about this. Origen talks about this passage. He says, G, uh, Josephus, quote, did not accept that our Jesus is the Christ. And then he also mentions it in another place. And it seems as if... How would he know Josephus did not accept Jesus as the Christ unless there was something in what he was reading, namely the antiquities, that let him know, such as Josephus saying something like, some called him the Christ or he was the so-called Christ? Uh, that's a question that I think is a good question, because what I'm saying is it's evidence that there is an earlier, untampered with version of the text. i got to move fast. Sorry, I had more points originally, but let me talk about three reasons why. The version that's a Christ myth version of Jesus is wrong. Firstly, it results in a historiography of evasion. Evasion, invention, and actually inconsistency. For example, all the evidence for an earthly Jesus in the Pauline corpus, each one has to be evaded. The Gospels have to be written off as historical allegory. There's a big evasion going on there. I'm not saying that you personally don't answer questions. You're excellent at answering from your framework. I'm not saying that you dodge the question. What I mean is the theory itself has to dodge evidence, just, just so you understand what I'm saying. I'm not doing an ad hom by that. I'm saying as a tactic, it has to proceed that way. It has to evade every corroborative source. It's interesting. They'll say Tacitus is maybe an interpolation, even though it talks about Jesus. But I know that if Tacitus never mentioned Jesus, Christ mythicists would say, why didn't Tacitus mention Jesus? But then he's in there, and there's a way to get away from it. So it's constantly evading. It's almost what I might want to call a dodgeball theory. It always has to get out of the way of evidence. I don't think it's quite as good as actually presenting its evidence. When it does, second reason why it's not true, it misinterprets its sources. Great example of this is with the Addis cults that you mentioned in um, – on historicity of Jesus. Here in the back, you've got a thing where you say, Jesus was preached crucified, Addis was preached crucified. And then you're showing there's some kind of parallel, and it doesn't have to necessarily be the case. The crucifixion happened, page 615. You say, Addis was castrated, was a stumbling block for many. You cite Augustine, City of God, 6, 10 through 11, book 6, that's sections 10 through 11. I went there. It was Augustine quoting Seneca from a now lost work called On Superstition. And in it, Seneca says the masses dig these castrated gods. He actually never mentions in this pericope that you mentioned, never actually says the word Addis. He does mention castrated gods. However, it's there's some guesswork to say he definitely means Addis. But then he says the masses like them. He, he says, I don't like them. And Augustine is saying, hey, even some of your pagans recognize the foolishness of your gods. That's the point there. But what I'm saying is that's a misuse of the source to say it was a stumbling block for many because Seneca's point, according to Augustine, is that everybody was down with these gods, such as Addis being castrated. Uh, I'll have to do the last one. Thank you very much, guys, for keeping me on target here. Lastly is um, that – where do I – Last uh, number three go. Oh, um, it n not only misinterprets its sources, the Christ Smith theory, but it also misunderstands uh, first century Judaism. Wait, that's not my third point. Hold on, I'm losing my notes. There it is. Oh, I'll just have to say this one because we're almost done. Sorry, I'm still learning. Thirdly, the Christ Smith theory relies upon dubious documents and dubious dating, meaning you're going to hear him mention the ascension of Isaiah. The dating of that, the textual history of that, is extremely problematic to build any type of case on it. 
They've got a late date Acts. They've got a late date uh, lots of other New Testaments. They've even got a late date some of the church fathers. So there's a lot of dubious documents, documents with shoddy textual history. I don't mean the Gospels. I mean these non-canonical items. And so it relies on a shaky foundation in the proceeds if, it, if, if it's certain. So it's a third reason why I would say Christman theory is not true. Excellent. Well, uh, Dr. Carrier, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Right, sure. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, I think in, in reality, if you just read my book, you already get the reputation of everything you just said. So um, for people who are interested in going into full detail, uh, that's what I would recommend you do. Uh, compare that with what, what the things he said are those legitimate complaints about the book, given the way the book presents the evidence and cites the scholarship backing it as well. Um, he, he b briefly mentioned multiple attestation and reliable eyewitness accounts. We don't actually have either of those things. The Gospels, all mainstream scholarship outside of fundamentalism agrees the Gospels were not written by eyewitnesses. And Paul does not, he's not an eyewitness of meeting a historical Jesus and does not actually specifically say anyone else was either other than through revelations. Multiple attestation, all the Gospels are just redactions of Mark. So really, you can't really say there's multiple attestation. That's And many scholars agree with this point of view, and I cite numerous scho mainstream scholars uh, in my book on that. Um, also, testable claims close to the events. He didn't give any examples, so I don't know what he means. Uh, internal consistency, that obviously can be debated. Fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, obviously if you're writing a book about someone, you can tell any story you want that fulfills any prophecy you want. Uh, the question is, can we verify that's the case? And no, we can't actually. Um, and then I, I won't address the questions of artistic merit or universal appeal or transformative power. I think there's a lot to be said about actually some of the things Jesus says and doesn't say are actually morally problematic. Um, and uh, artistically, I think the Gospels are brilliant, but um, so is a lot of ancient literature uh, by a lot of different religious believers with different religious beliefs. So uh, I don't see that as particularly uh, relevant to this debate here. Um, but let's get to the idea of the historical chaos. He, he spent a lot of time on the alabaster jar incident. But the thing is, is that the Gospels don't give any of the reasons that he gives. He's basically making up reasons by, by looking for other possible explanations for this. The Gospels say she anointed him for burial, um, which makes no sense historically. Uh, it, it's not explained why she has so much money that she can use such expensive oil. It doesn't explain why these details are so specific, uh, why these numbers are there. And this is in John where we know he uses number symbolism a lot, like the 153 fish that are caught, uh, the number of pots and, and, and their, their volumes that are in uh, at Cana. He does number symbolism a lot. So we know there's probably something going on in terms of what the numbers mean. If you want to look into that, I cite the scholarship that have studied this extensively in, in the book. But um, that's not historical chaos. That's just the reality. Uh, the reality of ancient history is we don't know the answer to a lot of things. Uh, so we have to, like, accept the fact that there might be multiple possible interpretations and we can't prove one or the other to be true. Um, that's just the reality of how, uh, how history works. Um, but let's get back to the extra biblical sources um, as corroboration. They aren't, actually. We don't have a single extra biblical source that serves as legitimately a corroboratory source. Now, a corroboratory source has to be independent. So, for example, if, like, Tacitus, the most likely source for his information is Pliny, his source we know from Pliny himself uh, is asking Christians, and their source would have been the Gospels. And this is early 2nd century. So Tacitus is not, there's no evidence in Tacitus that he's independently corroborating the Gospels. He's just repeating what the Gospels say through a number of intermediaries. Um, and that's even if he did say it. Uh, there, there is legitimate debate as to whether that's the case. But uh, even if he did, it's not corroboratory evidence. It's actually just a repeat of the Gospels. So we can't use that evidence. That's actually ruled out by the, the basic rules of historical methodology. When we get to Josephus, um, I explain, I give a number of reasons, and many scholars agree with me, and I cite them in the book, a number of reasons in the book why there's no way he could have written any of the Testimonium Flavianum, which is the, the one little tiny paragraph where he just praises Christianity. Um, in fact, it's been demonstrated by scholars that actually that paragraph derives from Luke, that it actually follows some of the systematic parts of Luke's Emmaus narrative in such a way that it's highly improbable uh, that it comes from any other source. So actually, whoever did write that passage was using Luke as a source. So even if it was Josephus, that's not corroboratory. He's just copying what the Gospel of Luke said. So uh, we can't even use it even then. But there are other reasons to, to doubt it. I mean, the, the idea that Origen cites this passage is actually not true. 
Uh, Origen knew. Origen was a Josephan scholar. He had a lot of Josephus' books. He cites him. He likes him a lot. The only passages Origen could find to corroborate uh, details of the gospel stories, and he says this, are passages attesting to John the Baptist and passages attesting to what he thought was James, uh, although, in fact, he actually quotes or paraphrases Hegesippus, not Josephus, so Origen was confused as to this point. But uh, he, when he says that Josephus did not accept Christ, he's referring to the fact that Josephus' last book, against Appion, uh, thoroughly uh, defends the position of, of Judaism against a pagan attacker. So he's basically just saying that Josephus remained a Jew as far as all the evidence shows, that he was never converted to Christianity. Uh, so there's, there's no indication there that he's actually citing the testimony of Flavian or, or was aware of it at all. So we can't use that evidence either. Uh, but what we would see if Josephus wrote that passage, and this is one, one of many reasons why he couldn't possibly have is that uh, the word Christ would be meaningless to his audience. When Josephus brings up a term or concept that he knows his Gentile audience wouldn't know the meaning of, he explains what it means. And there's no reference in there to explaining what on earth a Christ was. Why is it even relevant to be called one? Uh, so we know for a fact that there's no way Josephus wrote that. That was written by a Christian who just assumed everybody knew what Christ was because he's a Christian and obviously. But, uh, but if Josephus had written it, he would have gone through a, an explanation of it. He would have also explained things like what were the Christian beliefs. When he talks about Jewish sects, he always gives a breakdown of what they believed, what specifically their beliefs were that set them apart from other Jewish sects. He doesn't do that. So there are many, there are, that's just a few. There are many other aspects of the Testimonium Flavianum that, that don't, uh, obviously don't come from Josephus. So I don't think there's any basis for believing that that's actually there. When we get to, um, Attis though, um, I think uh, there's a misunderstanding of the argument here because the idea that the people loved these kinds of gods is exactly the point. Um, when you have the elites like Tacitus and not just uh, not just Seneca, but also Tacitus and others have also also said things that they were very embarrassed by these religions. They thought they were ridiculous. The idea of castrating yourself was emasculating. It was it was like so embarrassing. Why would anybody teach this? Why would this be a religion? And yet they spread like wildfire. And that's the point, is that you can't say that a crucified God would be anathema to the people because we know the people loved embarrassing gods with embarrassing stories. There was – even the elites would follow sometimes. For example, the god Romulus is a fratricide. He killed his – murdered his brother. That's considered – when you look in Virgil's Aeneid, one of the few things, very few sins that actually results in your being eternally burning in hell within the pagan scheme is killing your own brother. And yet here is this divine being who murdered his own brother in his own myth, and yet he's worshipped and revered. So the idea that there are embarrassing aspects to that story just shows that embarrassing aspects to a story do not make it true. In fact, there were lots of religious reasons why these things had cultural relevance and could actually be uh, important and believed. And in the case, of course, Jesus crucified uh, martyrs was a big thing in Judaism, and also even... Even the pagans had their own martyr stories like this. So we have, for example, the, the Jewish martyrs um, in Maccabean literature, uh, which were considered that their crucifixions were considered as cleansing the sins of the Jews. Uh, and, and they were regarded, hailed as heroes and, and regarded uh, constantly as, as heroic. Uh, so being crucified was not embarrassing. And that's, that's the point with that. So you can't argue to the truth of the crucifixion from that. Um, now, you he ended with the dubious dating. How much time do I have left on that? I got a minute. Or it looks like two. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure what he means by that. Uh, with the ascension of Isaiah, he didn't explain what the dating has anything to do with the way I use the document. So uh, I guess you, you should just look at my book and see how the way I use the document. Uh, doesn't pertain, but uh, what I do rely on is mainstream scholarship. All the expert scholarship on that document says what I say. I don't actually go against the mainstream scholarship on it. Um, so I'm, I'm actually citing with the experts, uh, and I think as I think we should do, unless we can actually demonstrate that they're wrong somehow. And even with the other documents, like the, the dating of Acts, the dating of Luke Acts, um, my view on that is actually the, the growing mainstream view. All of the leading experts who are not fundamentalists, uh, the leading experts like Richard Pervo and various others, I cite many of them in my book, all agree that the book of Acts and Luke was were probably written early second century. Uh, so that, that's a mainstream view. That's not actually going against the normal, uh, dating of documents. And we can't prove that it's any earlier than that. That's, that's the other thing is like, you can speculate that it's earlier than that. Uh, but you can't do much more, uh, about that. Um, so, I mean, I, I find these kinds of arguments altogether 
aren't sufficient to actually take on the kind of evidence that I marshal in the book. Uh, I think that there's a lot more evidence against these kinds of claims in the book than were even addressed here today that I even have time to mention here. Uh, so I think the important thing is if you're going to interact with these kinds of arguments, you've got to do things like read the book, look at the, the evidence that's spelled out there, look at the scholarship that I cite, um, see who else agrees with me. And then if you're going to look at opposition in the in scholarly community, fundamentalists and so on, um, compare their logic and their presentation of facts with mine, and then you can come to your own conclusion. All right. Well, you had uh, four seconds left there. <laughs> 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 All right. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to dive into the rebuttal. So, Vocab, you have seven minutes for rebuttal. Sure. On the woman with the alabaster jar, you said... Uh, I went uh, looking for other historical reasons, but the Gospels don't give those reasons. But remember, you specifically said there's no historically intelligible reason why she would have done that. So she personally could have had those reasons because I'm showing it was there's cultural precedent for. It. In fact, I got a book on Jesus and his archaeological world. As in, that's not the full title, but it's actually by uh, two folks associated with the Jesus Seminar, and they so they're they're no conservatives, and they talk about this, and they even say if more of this evidence would have been known at the time, perhaps the seminar would have actually viewed this as an authentic saying because it was one they didn't view as authentic. So there was a historically intelligible reason. Remember, Jesus is the one who gave the the sort of exegesis of the event. He's interpreting the event to people saying, hey, uh, she shouldn't be doing that. She should be instead selling it for the poor. And it is interesting to note, again, I looked up um, the cost of, of something like that and the cost that actually, I believe it's Pliny the Elder again, I, again, I got the source on me, uh, gives is actually really close to that. I think there's a difference of a thousand and their time's not exactly the same and they may not be talking about the same perfume. So one gives the actual, so you talked about the numbers uh, with Mark, what I'm saying is the number, uh, is, is it Mark or is it John? I forget which one, which actually says the amount of it, which is 3,000 denarii or whatever. The amount is actually about what it would cost at that time. So there's this, so the, these little incidental historical things that would be true. And, and so I don't think that's fully dealing with it by saying uh, that. And it's interesting, just when people read through the book, I want them to be aware of things. For example, in that same account, uh, you you say that Jesus declares wheresoever the gospel shall be preached throughout the whole cosmos, what this woman has done will also be spoken of as a memorial of her, Mark 14, 9. I just find it slightly misleading. You don't translate cosmos. Now, I know cosmos is world. I know uh, it, that's a way it could be translated. But it seems as if you when, when you have an, you're making your own English translation and you leave this word untranslated, it seems as if is it done to say, in relation to sort of the cosmic Christmas theory again, because it, it doesn't say, you, you didn't translate that one word. I, I guess I would want to know why if you have time to, to answer that. And then um, in relation to some of the other things you said, I, I would like to know if you're able to answer, how do you know, because you, you sound relatively certain about where Tacitus got his information from, but there's a number of sources Tacitus could have got his information from. Uh, Tacitian scholars like Malor, uh, you know, are good they talk about possible sources for Tacitus. To just say it was from Gospels of Christians, even if it was authentic, as you say, I just, the certainty, it, it, it's like it goes from a maybe to a definite to try to refute the evidence. It doesn't seem convincing to me. And to say that the TF derives from Luke, um, um, I know there's some people that think that, That's, but I, the reasons would be good to hear. Um, and and I would also want to hear the reasons why you believe you're, you're certain, because I don't think it's quite the case. In fact, there's a great book. It's a compendium of Josephine scholarship. I believe the title is, well, I got it somewhere in my bag. It's edited by Feldman. You've probably seen it. Uh, Josephus, Judaism and Christianity. And, and they talk about origin does mention Josephus in the places that I mentioned. Um, also, um, this, this, this word for Messiah, um, this Greek word Christos, Remember, it would have had some natural meaning in the Greek as basically anointed one. And when you were talking, I, I brought up Bauer, uh, and it, you know, the lexicon, to look to see where else that uh, appeared in Greek literature. Now, I didn't get to find it before we were done, but what I'm interested in to see is, is it the case that if Josephus would have mentioned Messiah, which would have just been Christos, would he have had to drop down and sort of explain it to everybody? I don't 100% think that's the case. And even if that's sort of a conjecture, you're like saying, well, he didn't explain the term, and so therefore he could have never said the term. I mean, even that could be 
even though I think that's entirely conjectural, that could be answered by saying, well, that's that's another Christian interpolation, but the rest of the text is authentic, because remember later on, he does mention James, and he does say the brother of the so-called Christ. At the very least, it could just be, since Josephus doesn't use that term for anyone else, it could just be Josephus' way to, to recognize the guy, to give him a name. But it would have some meaning as a Greek word either way. It doesn't have to have the same theological cash value. And with Addis, you said I was missing the point. I wasn't saying... I don't think I was saying what you were saying I was saying either. What I was saying more specifically is not necessarily about the stumbling block idea per se. What I was saying is that it was you were misusing the source, meaning uh, that Seneca doesn't say it's a stumbling block for many. In fact, it's the opposite. He's saying the masses do go after these castrated gods. Remember, it doesn't say Ada specifically. And I find it interesting. If a Christian was saying something... Uh, say in the 5th century, like Augustine, and he was reporting on an earlier pagan writer on a now lost work, would you trust it implicitly? But here it seems you are trusting Augustine's reporting, which is fine with me. I'm just saying it doesn't seem like in other places you would do that. Yet you're trusting on a now lost work that Augustine is correctly citing this. But then even when you get there, you, it is a misuse of what it's actually saying because Seneca doesn't agree with it, even though he seems to say at the end of the passage, hey, but it's cool to do for tradition and to keep things kosher. You know, that's my that's a paraphrase, but it seems like that's what he ends up saying. So it's not at as castrated is not a stumbling block. My point is not the, necessarily the parallel with the, the, the chart you have. Uh, or the table, I'm sorry. It's more the fact of this. people would not look that source up and they wouldn't really know. That's not exactly right. And even the first thing, Addis being preached as castrated, it makes it seem almost like there's the same missiological uh, sort of uh, plan as you have in Acts. But uh, where's the evidence of that? Yeah, we know that there was these festivals of March that they had, but to say like was preached, it seems like it's just using the Christian language to describe it to make the parallel grow. That's sort of a side point. Um, and then I, I, I know what you're saying. Um, where did it go? Okay. Da, da, da. Okay. Oh yeah. I'm trying to read my notes, but that wasn't a way to read it. Okay. The Ascension of Isaiah, what I'm saying by that is there, the reason why it's relevant is because the dating would affect whether it could be influencing the people you say are inventing a Christ myth theory, because you have to get it to be able to influence the gospel writers or whichever Christian you're saying it's influencing, it's got to be able to have an influence on them. So that's why the dating is important. And the textual history is shoddy. I mean, we've got variants all over the place, and some of the variants would go against your case, as you very well know. And then some of the best translations or some of the best manuscripts are actually translations. They're not from the original language, such as this Ethiopic. It's just problematic, and I don't think that it is a very sure foundation for anyone's case. All right. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Carrier, uh, you have seven minutes for your rebuttal when you're ready. Right. Um, well, I want to reiterate with the whole alabaster jar thing is that she had well, the point of that is that she had no reason why we lost light. <laughs> OK, uh, she had no reason to anoint him for death uh, and there is no evidence for any other reason. Now, you can speculate a reason, but if your premise is a speculation, then your conclusion has to be a speculation. A speculation is not a historical fact. It's just a speculation. If it's speculation in, it's speculation out. Uh, so this is just a basic understanding of how historical reasoning works. So we can't do that. Um, we have to ask, though, why are the numbers in the story? Why are they so precise? John, we notice, unlike other Gospels, uh, usually puts numbers in his stories where they aren't relevant to the story, um, like the 153 fish that are found, for example, and the, and the pots and their volumes and so on. Um, so... We're looking at the whole total context. Usually when we see things like that, that's what's going on. There's some sort of symbolic reason for this to be mentioned. There's no other reason given, nor is there any particular reason that's historically likely. I mean, there's no particular reason as to why she would think Jesus is going to be a king, and that therefore she, of all people, who's not even an official who can actually has the authority to anoint someone, should anoint him. I mean, there's numbers of aspects of this that don't make any sense in, historically. And this, the same goes for many other scenes in the Gospels, as I point out. Um, my, the reason I didn't translate cosmos is because it's not clear what is meant by that. Uh, whether it is me, does mean the whole cosmos or whether it only means the sphere below the moon, if it only means on earth. So uh, when, when the word can mean multiple things and we don't know what is actually meant, it's best to not translate it or, or actually to translate it in its broadest sense, which is what I did. You can make of that what you will. Uh, it doesn't really in, entail any particular interpretation. It just means that it could mean a number of different things. Um, 
And also when we get to Tacitus, this is, gets back to historical methodology again. Sure, you can talk about the possibility that maybe Tacitus could have gotten his information from somewhere. But if your premise is Tacitus could have gotten this information, then your conclusion has to be Tacitus could possibly be a, a corroboration of Christ. But that, the history of the city of Christ, but could possibly be is not usable as a conclusion. So uh, speculation in, speculation out, you can't do anything with that. On the other hand, however, uh, I did not state that with certainty. I actually said it's more probable, the most probable. And in the book, I extensively show, present evidence for why the most likely source for Tacitus is Pliny. I give numbers, of, I give a number of pieces of information that make this highly likely as the most likely place where Tacitus learned it. We have no comparable evidence for him learning it from any other source. Um, now, I'm going to stop briefly because you've raised the volume in my headphones to an almost painful level. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't know why, I don't know what's happened now. That's very Dude, strange. Yeah, that Andre's better? on my side. <laughs> Is that a little better? Technically. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Much okay, better. Thank go. you. Right, so um, yeah. <laughs> that was weird. Um, okay, so we get back to Josephus. Um, now it's a little too quiet, but anyway. <laughs> Way to sabotage him, Andre. Keep it up, man. You're doing great, bro. Right. Um, if Josephus said anointed for example, he would have to explain that because anointed for whom? Anointed by whom and anointed for what? It's not said. He would have to explain that. He would have to explain why it's even significant to say that about Jesus. Why is that even relevant? Uh, it's not even enough to say that, well, that's how, why the Christians were named it because he would have to explain why was Jesus named that? What, what, is that, what does that mean to the, to the Christians? Why, where did he get that name? Why? And we know this because Josephus explains these kinds of basic facts everywhere else in his book. So that we know that that's what he does. We know he's writing for a Gentile audience. He would need to explain why he's mentioning this, why it's relevant. Uh, that's just an example. And there are many, many other aspects of that passage that are just like this, where he would have to explain things. And I, I go through them in the book in detail. Um, when we get to Attis, I've I got to reiterate that Seneca is saying that it's a stumbling block for people of his social class, right? And that's relevant because when people try to cite... Uh, the crucifixion as being a stumbling block, the only evidence they really have for that is amongst the upper classes in terms of, of the elite looking down on them. That's exactly the same scenario. That's why it's parallel. When you look at, for example, how people react to the crucifixion of martyrs and heroes, uh, they actually don't see that as embarrassing at all, in fact. Um, so, so there isn't any case to be made that it's embarrassing among the people that it matters to. And even when we look in Paul, he says that it was only a stumbling block for some Greeks, not for all Greeks. So even there, he's not really attesting to the fact that it was a stumbling block for everyone. Uh, it, it was just a weird thing that some people thought was ridiculous. And we get an example of why certain people thought it was ridiculous from Seneca, but also from Tacitus and a few other authors like that. And in fact, we have extensive evidence throughout uh, the Roman Empire that castration was considered distasteful. Uh, it was considered emasculating. It was it would it reduced your social class and so on. So that that's just a general. You can look at the general literature for the ideas and constructions of masculinity in the ancient world and see how that plays out. But um, that's not relevant to the point here, which is that lots of people were okay with these kinds of things. And then when we get to the ascension of Isaiah. Um, I actually don't argue anywhere in the book that the ascension of Isaiah as a document that we can reconstruct influenced the origins of Christianity. Uh, I actually use it only as evidence that there was a sect of Christians in the early second century who believed these things, uh, which is a proof of concept, uh, and it is relevant in terms of being possible trace of an earlier sect. And I use it responsibly in that way. I don't actually try to argue that it is the seminal document of Christianity. Um, so uh, we can't really... There's not, he's not really arguing against how I use the document in the book. Um, and that that's really covers all of the things that we've talked about so far. Um, and if there's more, I guess we can continue from there. All right. Still got a minute. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yielding the minute. Okay. So we'll uh, be jumping into the cross-examination uh, right after a quick mm. break. We'll be right back with more Unbelievers Radio. All right. So let's. Uh, we're going to go ahead and dive into the cross-examination period here. And we've decided on the, over the break, we decided to add three more minutes to it to give a little more time for questions. So uh, <clears throat> Vocab gets to go first for the cross-examination. You have ten minutes. Uh, 
to question Dr. Carrier. Mm-hmm. Sure. All right. Well, let me uh, make one errata. When I was trying to explain the price of the denarii and all that, uh, I didn't exactly say it right. So for what I was trying to say, look up Jesus in his world, an archaeological mm-hmm. and cultural dictionary, and you'll see the way I did it was by taking the amount per pound and then yada, yada. But I didn't say it right. So just look that up, and it'll clarify what I was trying to say about the, the price specifically. But uh, that's my errata, at least, that I knew yeah. of so far. All right. So um, do you think, Dr. Carrier, that there are – books in the New Testament that do affirm like a more traditional these days historical Jesus. I know you think there's ones that don't like Paul, but do you think oh. there's ones that do within the canon? Well, sure. Like well, Luke Luke is clearly and well John even especially is trying to sell a historical Jesus. Help me understand what you mean by that when you call them historical allegories because that yeah. would make them not historical, right? No, if if you read, you know, in the book I have a whole section in uh in the elements in chapter 5, I think, uh where we have origin, you know, sort of popping the hood and revealing the way documents are written. And we have examples of this from pagan literature as well. It's called the the theory of double truth, uh, principle right. of double truth. Uh, and Origen says that the, there's the literal meaning, which is for you know the rubes on the street for the right. for the average Christian, and then Can I ask but a the real about meaning. That? Yeah, just, okay, right. Do but, you think yeah. Origen's because uh, within church history, when you study that, that mm-hmm. type of interpretation is closely connected to something Origen was a part of called the Alexandrian school, mm-hmm. as opposed to something later called the Antiochian school. For example, now this is later, but John yeah. Chrysostom, who disavowed that type mm-hmm. of like kind of secretive interpretation sure, that yeah, Origen yeah. had. Yeah, but how like do you say that Origen's saying that then is the same way a couple hundred years before so the gospel writers right doing well it. the reason is is that we have the exact same thing for all other mystery cults right uh we have for example osiris cult was doing the same thing they had the public stories which were putting osiris in history on earth but then the private stories were saying no that's just an allegory for the cosmic reality do you see though how that might be called begging the question because no no assuming it's, Christi- it's, well, it's an argument from probability or prior probability right so everybody's doing it so if the Christians are doing it, odds are they're doing the same thing. We would need evidence otherwise. But to answer the question, you have to say uh, mystery cults did this. So you're assuming Christianity is one. I understand. Well, I don't assume it. Well, I, but it's, it, it, it does I, seem I demonstrate circular. it in the book, right? So, yeah. okay, here's, here's a question. Are there any other historical, like, for example, do you think Hebrews portrays a historical Jesus or a celestial being Jesus? Well, I think Hebrews is vague. Okay. Uh, it's ambiguous. Um, so there's there's nothing in Hebrews that it definitely attaches to a historical Jesus. Um, if we mean by historical Jesus, a guy walking around on earth. Because you have to realize that in, in the thesis that I'm defending in the book, which you know is a, a simplified version of Doherty's thesis, is the view that Jesus was a historical person in the same sense that the angel Gabriel or the angel Michael were believed to be historical people, right? Um, so he, it's just that the whole drama takes place in heaven or in some sort of supernatural realm. Uh, so, so like Paul, for example, would have believed that Jesus was a real person, that he really did get crucified and so on. Uh, but the interpretation or the understanding, the alternative theory is, is that they thought all of this stuff happened somewhere else. Can I ask a question um, about Hebrews? Uh, the author says that Jesus was tested on all points as we mm-hmm. were yet without sin. Mm-hmm. Um, I That seems like it ties it to historical Jesus. Now, I know I've heard you say you go to Philippians 2 and say yeah. that's the example. But here's my question. In Philippians 2, the word temptation is never mentioned. And how many of us have been tempted? Oh, it's described. To have, how many of us have ever been tempted to have equality with God, and here's the other, here's mm-hmm. the last thing I really want to get at. It says all points, not just one thing. Philippians, even yeah. if it is a temptation, which I don't uh, agree that it is, it's only one thing. Jesus what do you do was, with the all points? It, Philippians 2 says that Jesus was offered everything. He, so he was offered every single it's, possible it's not temptation. not literally what it says. Well, he says he could be equated with God, which it's actually a reference to the same thing that Satan wanted, right? That's, so it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's a negative parallel to Satan, right? Satan wanted all of the equations to God to have all of, to basically fall to all temptations and have all things. And then he failed the test, whereas Jesus passed the test. And that's why Jesus is great, right? That's the Philippians 2 argument. So when it says that he's, he was tempted in all things, in all ways, uh, just as we are, uh, that is easily just a reference to Jesus being offered every possible temptation. All right. Possibly more than, I certainly, you could say that, but it, it's not relevant to Paul's point, is that Jesus was tempted in more ways than we are. That makes that argument even stronger. That would be an a fortiori argument for Paul. Don't agree, but want to move on. In okay. Hebrews, it, it recognizes that he is not of the priestly line, and it says he's, it seems to recognize he's part of the line of Judah. So that's mm-hmm. also in Hebrews. That seems to yeah. recognize a historical Jesus. How can you be line of the Jew, uh, line of Judah if you don't exist? Right. And w- you read my book, so you know what my answer is to that. Yes. Is that where you would talk about the cosmic sperm bank? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, the body of flesh that dies because he has to have a body that can die. So he has to he has to assume a body. 
Uh, and and that, that clearly is part of the mythicist thesis. And that's clear in Paul, that he had to assume a body of flesh to die. And the prophecy was very clear on this, that that body had to be Davidic. It had to descend from David. Do you see that a person might say this is getting close to make it unfalsifiable? Because you can have physical beings. They well, can have... This, it can be easily can have... falsified. If Paul were to say, for example, uh, Jesus was Davidic because he descended from such and such and actually gave his genealogy or Well, something. Matthew and Luke do that. Right. But then that's decades later. Their gene- genealogies disagree. We have other letters in the canon that say you're not supposed to believe these genealogies. Um, and it was very common to make up genealogies. How do you know when Hebrews was written? Uh, well, that's argued in the book. Uh, but it, no, just one good reason. Well, Hebrews 9, the entire argument of Hebrews 9 assumes that the Jewish temple Correct. is still operating. So, so I agree with you there. Mm-hmm. I Actually, now you and I are in the minority of, I'm not saying I'm the scholar, but in the minority of scholars to say it's earlier. Yeah, I'm not sure even we though, are. But... Even though I agree. I mm-hmm. agree with that dating. But uh, uh, that's interesting to know, okay? I just saw how much time I have left, which yeah. is not as much as I want, <laughs> so let me move on to some other questions. Which is, how do you think it wound up that you had these, that Paul's version of Jesus put in the canon next to these historical Jesus? Didn't anyone notice they were establishing this library of documents that it was theologically incongruent? No, they weren't, because they actually eliminated all of Paul's letters and parts of his letters that disagreed with them. How uh, do you we, know that? Well, we know because Paul refers to letters he wrote that we don't have. Right, but We but know that on. because there are disagreements and disjoints in the letters we have. How do you know that, they're, because they're not extent, how do you know it means they eliminated them? Do you see that leap there? Oh, no, no, it doesn't matter. They disappeared. You can make up any excuse you want. They're not there. Right, right? but even... They, when they chose what to put in the canon, they chose documents that they could make agree with their view. Chose to put in the canon. I've heard you even speak in more sober terms, talk about the canon was more of an organic process, if, unless oh, I'm right. mistaken. So yeah, to say chose to put in the canon doesn't seem like a correct phraseology. No, 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 no. You're, you're confusing an official church council decision versus who assembled the canon, which... You know, uh, Trobish is one of the scholars who's actually argued that it was probably Polycarp that put these books together. Someone decided, someone made the decision to put these books into the Bible. Uh, That person was clearly a historicist. Just one person? Well, it could have been more people. We don't know. Okay. Um, but, But the decision was made. So there was a conscious decision made not to put certain books in and a conscious decision to put certain books in. And and we see that even like, for example, you look at the transition in 1 Corinthians 8 to 1 Corinthians 9, something's missing. Something's been cut out. Uh, we have lots of examples of that. You know, look at any mainstream scholarship. You look at the New Interpreter's Bible uh, reference guide on, on uh, the epistles. There's lots of scholarship on there are these disjoints in all of the epistles. Someone has taken a number of epistles and stitched them together. All right. I hear your reasons, of course. Don't, don't agree with that. I don't. Okay. <laughs> but but let, me, let me say this. In a review of Bart Ehrman's stuff, you said, quote, even by Ehrman's own faulty assumptions, and then you put in parentheses, mm-hmm. he gullibly trusts the interpolation in 1 Thessalonians 2 to be authentic. Now, in 1 Thessalonians 2, you're talking yeah. about a place where it refers to the Jews crucifying Jesus. Yeah. Here's my question. Why do you think he's being gullible when there's no manuscript evidence to back up your claim that it's an interpolation? Mm-hmm. Well, we can actually prove statistically that there have to be at least 20 interpolations in the New Testament that we won't have manuscript evidence of because the manuscript record starts about 150 years too late. Um, And we can actually show the rate of interpolation over the next thousand years. So we actually, and we can project back and we know from textual studies outside the Bible and just all ancient texts that the first hundred years of a transmission of a text is the highest rate of interpolation and, and error. So there's so, some truth there, but, yeah, yeah, but what we I'm know saying this, is so specifically, I'm getting there. There's no so, manuscript evidence for the but claim. We don't, we don't need manuscript evidence because we know there are some interpolations. So what we need is evidence that someone didn't write something. So for example, in that case, and we have Pearson and many other scholars have pointed this out. This is a mainstream view. This isn't something I'm radically going against Ehrman on. It's, I disagree uh, that it's so mainstream. For example, Ehrman's mainstream, yeah. and here's a here's a book. This is a doctoral yeah. thesis all about it. This is not from a conservative scholar. Yeah, yeah. If you know this, Carol Schluter, mm-hmm. and she is not, she, she would be... No, but she, she does have an agenda. And she has a theological agenda. Look, Dr. Carey, that yeah. is not a good reason to argue you out of the evidence, because you have what an is agenda. She doesn't have any arguments in there. She certainly does have no, arguments no, no, in there, no. but they, this They're is... all based on theological premises about anti-Semitism, things like that. Okay, so... So, uh, what we're looking at when when i present the evidence in the book we have things where paul says things in that passage that he denies elsewhere in his literature so i disagree but you got Ro- let me finish my time by making a statement you got romans 9 through 11 which is 10 or so years after first thessalonians and it's much more fleshed out and paul's not anti-semitic there he's anti-sin and if this oh, yeah. is congruent oh, yeah. this Ro- is, romans is not anti-semitic at all this is con- no, in fact romans contradicts he's not the, in first thessalonians 2 he either 
just my point is they are congruent. Oh, no, no. Which he, is further, he says the Jews have been damned by God for uh, for we, finality. Read Romans so. nine through eleven. It's a hardening of uh, via disbelief. It's yeah, it's also, not saying the same thing though. In Acts chapter four, you have the same thing. The early church talks about the Roman leaders, the Jewish leaders, everybody conspiring together. Right, go ahead and finish up your uh, yeah. statement. And so it's not incongruent. Further, Jesus himself said something similar about what Jerusalem does with his prophets. Yeah, none of that agrees with what we're talking about in that passage. So I, I would ask people to look at Pearson's paper and also my summary of it in uh, in time. So, okay, well, Doctor Carrier, you have uh, ten minutes for cross examination. Okay, uh, basic principle: if you can't prove a source is independent, you can't use it as corroboration. Is that right? Just repeat it. We'll, we'll say what you mean. In time. order, in order to claim any kind of evidence is corroboratory, that it's corroborating something, you have to prove that it's independent. Independent of the original source. Yeah, to make yeah. it corroborative. Yes. Right. Okay. I understand. Yes. So we, we can't prove that any extra biblical evidence, any of the evidence outside the Bible is independent of the Bible. But you're asking me that as a question? Yeah. So I don't agree with that. Well, give me an example of one you can prove is independent. Well, for example, Tacitus, uh, in his position, would have access to well, records. Well, that's not a proof. That that's no a longer... speculation. I mean, can you so, prove that he used some oh, other source? Well, no, no. But uh, I don't um, – there's a there's – a, the, to, but the, it goes the same way to say we know for certain he just got a hold of the gospel. Yeah, but it works the other way around. Talk to Christians. It doesn't work. That, I mean, you can't If have the that premise certainty. is it's possible that he used another source – the conclusion has to be it's possible that he corroborates the Gospels, not that he does. Do you agree with that statement? Um, if In general, I will say that's a true statement. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we'll just leave it at that because that's that's the reason why we can't use the extra-biblical evidence because it only gives us possibilities. It doesn't give us proofs of anything. Um, but let me let me move on to uh, the Gospels. Well, let's, let's suppose – and I know you don't think the Gospels are heavily mythical, but let's suppose someone – comes to that conclusion. Someone agrees that the Gospels have tons of myth in them. Um, so you're, you're going you're gonna to accept that, that, okay, so I can't dis disabuse you of that belief. So what would you tell that person that uh, what should they think would still be, what they could still be sure is historical in the Gospels, even, even despite the fact that they agreed a lot of it is mythical? What, what do you think is demonstrably historical in the Gospels to someone who's in that position? Right. So... My view is that the more we deny the portrayal of Jesus in the New Testament, the more chaotic uh, that the whole question becomes. And so I would show them uh, – I would sort of instead show them how competing theories don't work. That's what I would actually probably work to do in that specific case instead of, instead of trying to go to other evidence. Remember in my opening statement, Dr. Carrier, mm -hmm. I said that the secondary evidence, it was secondary, and I yeah. specifically said it was inferior, saying the Gospels yeah. were superior. Okay. So I would go to competing theories to show them how they don't answer the question. So it would be more like uh, a, a ultimately polemical, saying look out at the varying theories, and you're going to find problems that don't make sense of the data. Now come back. And let's make sense of the data yeah, from the Gospels. So you're basically saying that there is, let's say, there's at least one passage in the Gospels that refers to a historical Jesus that can't be explained any other way than it being a reference to a historical Jesus or it being proof of a historical I would Jesus. say there's tons more than one. Sure, sure. Yeah, but at least one, right? There's yeah. definitely at least one, Okay, yes. so give me an example of one of those. The, oh, the, you can't make – well, the, he's uh, of the seed of David. Uh, well, that okay. That that's actually one of the worst examples. There's no way that the, even if Jesus was a historical person, there's no way they could verify that. They didn't even have the scientific capability to identify that. Oh well, but I'm, <laughs> my point is, you wouldn't have a, an author uh, uh, saying that he's of the seed of David if he, he thought he didn't exist. That's what I meant. Oh, oh, Maybe I'm oh, misunderstanding what no, you're no, asking. Okay, yeah, no, that's that's an interesting point because that brings me back to what I was saying before about how the theory is that he did exist. I mean, these, the, Paul does believe he exists. He does believe he uh, assumed a body of flesh. And he believes that God manufactured a body of flesh for him so that he could die. Uh, and we see that in when he says, you know, um, in Romans 1, 3, he uses the word that Paul uses, the exact same word Paul uses of the manufacture of Adam's body and the exact same word that he uses of the manufacture of our future resurrection bodies, which neither of which are born. And he says they – so he's basically saying it was manufactured out of the seed of David. Now, would you agree that that's a possible reading, that, that you can't really prove that one way or the other? 
Um, no, I don't. I don't. Why? I mean, I don't think you have good evidence that that's what you should do lexically, and I don't really think you're going to find. Well, I just very... presented the evidence that he uses the exact same word he uses you for manufacturing. Presented lines of uh, that sort of run parallel to or interlock with parts of your theory. You presented it from within well, I... your construct, no, no, but it's, that's it's... not actually evidence for it. Yeah, yeah. Paul uses the same word for the manufacture of, of flesh bodies twice. Wait, so you, we're not talking about seed of David because I said seed of David. We're Are you talking about, about born of woman? Manu- no, well, we're talking about manufacture of Adam and the manufacture of our future resurrection bodies. The exact same word he uses to describe God making those bodies, he uses it to describe Jesus' body. Are you, t- are you referring to... I'm not sure. Right now, Romans about... 1, 3. But so, yeah. so, okay, so not seed... So just seed, seed of David, yeah. So, but seed of David is just... That's that's just... Uh, that's That doesn't have anything to do with the manufacture part, does it? Sure, mean. if it's manufactured out of the seed of David. Okay, but where's the manufacture part in Romans 1? The word. He okay. uses the word for manufacture that he uses for the manufacturing of the body of Adam and the manufacturing of the body of our future resurrection bodies. It's the same word. Whereas when he talks about actual human birth, he uses a different word in Greek. Oh, you're talking about uh, descended or according to the flesh? I'm trying to understand. Yeah, descended which... is not in the Greek. That's that's an interpretation. The word descended is not there. It's it's made or becomes. Oh, genomino? Yeah, the, the generic, the most broad definition would be just becomes or came to be. And so that's what you're saying means manufactured? Yeah, because that's the way Paul talks about Adam and our future resurrection bodies. Well, I'm saying that it's at least 50-50, that we we can't tell which thing Paul means just from looking at that passage. Yeah. We would need more. um, So, I mean, right after it says, according to the flesh. He was yeah. descended from David according to the flesh, so that kind no, of... It, I, Matt, he, was, he came to be out of the seed of David according to the flesh, meaning that's the flesh body he received. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing else there that actually clarifies, right? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the case. You have other places in Romans where Jesus is uh, spoken of as really living. I mean, well, give even, me an example. Well, even Romans. I would say that even when you talk about Jesus Christ crucified, um, uh, I don't think that with that you even have the kind of possibilities you want to portray. I think most people that are living in Rome, especially when they hear. Jesus is crucified, they understand it the way we would see a yeah. picture of a crucifixion. And well, fact, that's, that's not true because... The evidence word, for that even is the starograms, yeah, for I, example. I cite the, recent, the most recent scholarship on this that shows that the word he uses is generic. It actually refers to all different types of execution, including, including Jewish execution. So it's actually not even specific to Roman execution. Um, all he's saying is that Jesus was hung up, essentially, hung up on a piece of wood. Um, which we know could happen in supernatural realms. We have the example of uh, we have the example of Inanna, for example, who was hung up, nailed up. Uh, her corpse was nailed up, naked, uh, in a supernatural realm, not on Earth. We know from the ascension of Isaiah that when we look at the earliest recreatable or reconstructable redaction of that, uh, that it appears to say that Satan and his demons are the ones who crucified Jesus in the lower heavens. So the possibility is there. So we would need more to be sure of what Paul's saying, because Paul never actually situates the crucifixion in, in, in any particular place, right? Uh, no, I mean, he, yeah. but he, second Thessalonians. And he never says the Romans did it, never says the Jews did First it. First Thessalonians 2. Well, there's that. You have to assume. Then, then you're on the debate of the you, interpolation. You're making but, yeah. a conjectural emendation. That means a guess that something it's shouldn't be there. It's not conjectural. We it have is, evidence, though. It's, it's not a conjecture. We, I know we, that, we have good case. I that's, know that you believe you need evidence yeah. for your. I know you, yeah, you yeah. believe. No, but you need we have it. It's in the peer-reviewed literature. We have a good case for this. So you uh, don't have any textual data. You don't have well, any don't manuscript evidence. Yeah, okay. we, we know well, that, there are. That's interpolations. where we disagree. Yeah, I, don't, I don't agree to go around see, making conjectural emendations. It's not conjectural. We have evidence for it. That's it, actually the technical name for that type of. No, no, guess. no, not at all. No, a conjecture is if you just conjecture. No, no. What I'm saying is, I'm speaking in the technical, like the TC world, the textual critical world. They use the phrase conjectural emendation. I'm not. I don't. I'm not saying it is like a. As a yeah. guess, like, oh, you're conjecturing. I'm actually saying but what you, they call that type of guess. It's called a conjectural emendation. You but then amend, that's not a criticism. You amend the text, yeah. but you don't actually have the manuscript evidence. You right. do it for other reasons. I don't find but that satisfactory at all. Oh, no, no, we do that all the time. We have to do that all the time. Uh, because we know there are tons of these errors in the text that we won't have manuscript evidence for. We don't go we around know that guessing, though. It's not a guess. We, we have evidence. We do we it. present a case. Right, here's the evidence. Yeah. When a manuscript has a variant, that's the evidence. No, there's tons of examples where that's not the case. This is normal in textual criticism. Normal. It's common. The first Thessalonians... The Testimonium Flavianum isn't a classic example of that. You even agree that it's been messed with, where there's no manuscript oh, evidence of it. No one can't with. not agree. Everyone yes. knows that. So you I mean, understand. No you understand. Everyone you everyone don't has... have to have manuscript evidence. Oh, well, you do in that case. 
No, we don't. Yeah, we do. You have the Arabic stuff. Oh no, that's all derives from Eusebius. That was proved by Alice Wheeling. I uh, know. It's not. I got. A, I brought an article for you. I brought a journal article just for you. What's just for the that. Date it's of it? printed out. I, it's in my bag. I have to turn okay. around and get it. But I, I'll no. give it to you before we leave. Alice Wheeling re- proved that fairly recently. She made an argument that that's the case. No, no she demonstrated it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it derives from Eusebius. It does not derive from an earlier version of the manuscript. So, uh, And it's not a manuscript of Josephus anyway. It's actually a quote yeah, in I another... Ar- it's and another, it's not even in Greek. It's, it's an, an Arabic, Arabic historian. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Well, but see, that's where the double standard comes in. You're going to go to it's a Central Isaiah standard. in Ethiopic, but you don't want to go to Josephus when he's got an Arabic historian. No, no, no. But uh, you were the one who was saying that it was an, another manuscript of Josephus, but it's not. It's it's a quotation yes. in another language by someone else centuries and centuries, centuries later, which a, a leading expert on it has proven actually derives th- through the intermediary of the Syriac from Eusebius and is not from an independent. She has answer. not won over Josephine scholars 100% or even anything like it. It's well, not, it's not a done oh, deal. You know, that's funny. You'd mentioned Feldman. Um, it's not clear that Feldman agrees because you're citing really obsolete stuff by Feldman. I mean, the, the whole field has changed on this in just the last five years. So we got to actually re-poll opinion on this uh, if yeah. you're going to Go ahead opinion. and uh, finish up your statement. Oh, no, that's it. We're good. So, do we have questions from the audience now? Uh, we so do. Uh, we are going to So take... much nerdery? Is that what no, you said? So much nerdery. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, if you I want to hear hardcore nerdery, <laughs> listen to his debate with Trent Horn. It took nerdery oh my God, yes. to a whole nother level. <laughs> no, it really is true. Um, also, I'll tell people there's a drinking game you can play if you listen to that debate. Hold on. I know what it is. Every yeah. time someone says, so, cites your books, right? When I do. Yeah, when you cite Every time book. I cite my book, you dr- take a drink. I was now, actually going to suggest that for the and, Q&A portion yes, of the Yes, and, uh, and Sean Taylor of the Maboom, Maboom show, uh, Make a Believer Out of Me, is that show is pretty cool. He strongly and correctly recommended that uh, you use communion cups, those tiny little uh, <laughs> disposable communion cups, because trust me. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Dude, you want to know what, though? It, it, this is just, a, you know, inside church, inside baseball stuff at church. We we were trying to figure out ways to, like, make the whole process community more efficient. And so they got these little cups. And then on the top, it had, like, a tiny little wafer that was, like, preserved and had a plastic thing over it. So it was on top of the communion cup. It was sealed. And then you'd open the seal of the plastic on top of the communion cup. And it was sitting there. Then remove the thing. So it was, a, it was all in one. So is that, like, a Keurig of Christ? <laughs> so we bought, we bought a lot of them. And, man, they tasted horrible. They're the worst <laughs> thing ever because it, they're so heavily preserved it tastes like eating a piece of paper plastic oh yeah and, and we were like dude er, instead of thinking about you know what you should at communion everyone's like dude this is the worst cracker thing i don't know even cracker know what this thing. is oh, it's like i want to go I worst want, thing ever they're online you can I find want to them. tell a story about ancient history that's completely unrelated it's like Dr. you might have just like caused someone to start drinking because someone in the comments <laughs> just said i'm grabbing a ball of tequila right now <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna jump to a quick break, uh, and then we'll come okay, back with yeah. uh, with the Q and A and some uh, more fun. Maybe we can get that story about ancient history you bet. in there too, yeah, right? Yeah. So let's go ahead and jump over to a written question. All right. Cool. Uh, the first question comes from Paul, and he asks, "Can Richard talk a little bit about Philo of Alexandria not mentioning Jesus and any of his miracles or mission?" Ah. Uh, well. Okay. That that would be a relatively weak argument for non-existence of Jesus. As long as you accept that Jesus wasn't famous, right? Um, Because Philo of Alexandria is one of the leading Jewish theologians of his time uh, in Alexandria. So anything that he thought was important between the 20s and 40s AD in Alexandria, he probably would have written about. Uh, He did write a whole book about the reign of Pontius Pilate, which was not preserved. Christians of the Middle Ages chose not to preserve it. Um, But we have no quotes from it or anything like that as well. Um, yeah, he certainly didn't notice Christianity at all, right? So theoretically, even on the mythicist thesis, Christians were evangelizing in Alexandria. So uh, for Philo, it probably does. He just didn't consider this as relevant, or, or it was an insignificant thing for him. So if he did write about it, none of those writings were preserved. Um, so we can't really argue from that silence that necessarily Jesus didn't exist. Um, only that the Christian movement was a lot smaller and, and less significant than the Book of Acts, for example, portrays. Um, that's kind of really the only relevant point to it. But it, but it does relate to because your, your questioner asked about miracles and things like that. Because you could talk about like the 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 uh, the the uh, dead of the saints who were raised and walked into Jerusalem. You have the the great earthquake. You have the sun going out for three hours. You have the feeding of thousands of people, miraculous feeding of thousands of people. And you have all of these different claw walking on water and stuff. You have all these different amazing claims. The triumphal entry. You have all these certain things. I am assuming your questioner 
is curious why those things weren't mentioned by Philo. But from my perspective is that you can accept that those things aren't true and still accept that there's a historical Jesus. Now, I think uh, Malone here will have a different answer to that, so I'll, I'll turn it over to him. I mean, I would just say, uh, from what we know, Philo may have visited the region once, it seems. We're not sure. And, uh, um, I mean, well, I'm at not least exactly. Once, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I'm not really expecting Philo to write about Jesus. I mean, Jesus, his, his ministry is largely confined to Galilee. I mean, he's in other spots in Israel, but he's there in Israel as the Gospels portray. Um, even when the rulers of his day hear about him, they only know a tad. You know what I'm saying? Like Herod, they're like, he wants to see some magic tricks, right? People still feel that way about Jesus, right? They want uh, Christianity to entertain them. You know, there's a little sermon point for you guys. Um, <laughs> I mean, Pilate's like, so what? You know, he, Pilate asks him some questions in John 18. But I'm saying even like the local uh, uh, like vices, you know, the dudes in charge, it ain't like they had a ton of interest or information about Jesus. And, when you look through the when you look through the history of Second Temple Judaism right there, you see there was a decent amount of people uh, wanting to spark rebellions or making some kind of claim to Messiah. So Jesus wouldn't really be all that extraordinary until sort of people note take when do they really take notice? It's when it's when it spreads. And when it gets to Rome, that's when people really start taking notice. I mean, there being um the idea is that it should have been recorded left and right. Um I don't think that's true. I actually don't even think there's that many people that would have done it either. You know, sometimes people talk about justice of Tiberius, but there's problems with that too. But mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a lot to say about Philo. All right. The next question comes from a guy named Spencer, who's sometimes on the show. <laughs> uh, but uh, he, his questions for both of you guys. It's what dates do you place the writings? Wait, what dates do you place on the writings of the Gospels and why? Mm -hmm. So, like, how do you date the Gospels? And we'll start with uh, Dr. Start Perry. with me. Um, well, we don't know. The, the way we normally date documents in ancient history is we give uh, termini. So, so no earlier than and no later than, and it could be any time in that, that range. Um, and really the Gospels aren't definitively attested until mid-2nd century, so they could possibly be that late. Um, when we get to Mark, and since all the other Gospels are based on Mark, and Mark clearly is aware of the destruction of Jerusalem, Generally, all scholars outside of fundamentalism agree that Mark was written in the 70s AD. I think Mark shows evidence of knowing about the Jewish War of Josephus, which would put it late 70s AD but uh, as the earliest. But one way or another, 70s AD as the earliest for, for the first gospel. Okay, now my headphones are getting crazy loud again. Yeah. <laughs> Better? Uh, no. Okay. No? Ooh, there you go. Yeah, right there? Yes, yes there right. you go. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Some sort of weird uh, circuit fault going here. This is all used um, equipment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so for dating, I that's the mainstream view is they put 70s for Mark, 80s for Matthew, 90s for Luke, and John, the turn of the century. Uh, but recently there have been a lot of scholars arguing for Luke being – basically putting these dates about 10, 20 years later than that. That's possible. Uh, and when I argue in the book on the history of City of Jesus, I stick with the traditional dates, uh, the traditional mainstream dates, which is you know between 70 and, and 115 or so for the Gospels. I would disagree that getting up to 115 is traditional. Um, so I would give a, an earlier date for Luke because I do view Luke as the author of Acts, and mm -hmm. I do view Acts as, well, I don't view it. It's not there. In chapter 28, you get to the end of the book of Acts, and Paul's waiting trial, yet he hasn't been executed under Nero. In fact, nobody really has except for a couple dudes in the more towards the beginning of the book. you still got Peter living. you still got Paul living. And uh, it's interesting, for example, if Acts is just some kind of romance novel or adventure novel, you always do have con usually some kind of resolution with the characters. So even on that reading, it's interesting, why do you not have the resolution at the characters at the end? They're sort of left hanging. It's like Empire Strikes Back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the reason I would say that's ha that, 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 that's a, that is that way is because it hasn't happened yet. So that would give an mm -hmm. earlier date yeah. for Acts, which would give an earlier date for Luke. Uh, another reason is sort of this pre-70 thing in general. So I don't discount the ability for God to know sure, or determine yeah. the future. Well, once you accept that premise. I yeah, so that. I don't have to I don't have to put everything past 70 because you have Jesus prophesying 
signifying the destruction of the temple. That's not the only evidence, but yeah, I guess you mean. In fact, I would even say that it's once the destruction of the temple happens, there's a lot of stuff that becomes more difficult to know about Jerusalem because you essentially have a different type of Jerusalem. And even you no longer have really have Second Temple Judaism, which mm-hmm. is sort of an era that scholars defined the, the yeah, day that Jesus lived in. Yeah. So for that to happen... What I see in the Gospels is I see an awareness of Second Temple Judaism in a pre-70 Jerusalem. And so I could see arguments being made to push the, the Gospels early because they know what Jerusalem is like before 70. And one, uh, the third reason why I would date the Gospels uh, earlier ex- even than Richard, although I don't put hard, fast dates on it. I would just say it's earlier than what you said. It may be earlier to some extent than what, what is more of a consensus view, which I would say is generally speaking mm-hmm. 65 to 90. You have John around that time. That's generally what I think is more of a consensus right. view. But there, uh, well, actually, two more reasons. One is early church fathers do cite them, or they make some kind of reference to them. They seem to be aware of the teachings at points, such as Ignatius, such as First Clement, and there's whole studies you've seen where they say, "What did he know? What Jesus said not." Lastly, yeah. in Timothy, I would say Paul wrote it. You would say Paul didn't write it. You'd say it's forgery. Okay, but either way, the author knows Luke's gospel, and I'm mm-hmm. and, and and because it says some it, scholars it, think Luke quotes, wrote the Timothys. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, there's a lot of good reasons to think that. But okay, let's just let's say that's the case. But the author knows Luke's gospel that's there, and he's quoting uh, something that Jesus said in Luke, and so that would show an earliness to the gospel tradition. And similarly, well, we of course, in First Corinthians Timothy, so. eleven, you have Paul giving uh, uh, Luke the Luke and Passion or the Luke and uh, Last Supper account or whatever. So well, it's the other way around. Luke is using Paul. Well, so uh, I don't I don't agree with that because the way Paul introduces it, of course, Paul says no. But Luke is clearly rewriting Paul. I mean, he he's completely rewritten the Galatians narrative, for example. He's doing this on purpose, and I, I document that in the book for people. I don't who are agree, interested. but I think it's an interesting argument. Right. Why doesn't Acts have more yeah. of the epistles in it? Because if what you're saying is true, then Luke writing Acts would have access to the epistles, yeah, well, but they're, they're, they're not yeah, really Luke included. Specific they're not included in Acts, and no, I would no, say that's yeah. another reason. The he reason doesn't want to. He, he wants to rewrite nah. history because he has an agenda. Because they're in process, so he actually yeah. doesn't have no. access to the epistles. I disagree that's, with that's that. That's why they're not in there. That, that, yeah. that's, a, that's a reason for their omission that makes sense. I, I follow the non-fundamentalist scholarship on this, which I cite in the book, uh, which is that Luke has a variety of agendas and is deliberately rewriting Paul. For these to pursue these specific agendas, and I talk about this. I do cite the literature in, on the historicity of Jesus, uh, and I talk about the reasons why these attempts to date Luke early don't work. But that's the debate you can have. It's yeah. not just fundamentalists. I mean, you have uh, Robinson. You know, the dude uh, way back in a day redating the New Testament. Yeah, I mean, he plays so old. Earth. This is hugely this obsolete. Is, this yeah. is, that, that's true. I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying, you know, he's no fundamentalist. And yeah, but things we gotta we gotta do with with current scholarship. Well, so that's an interesting to hear you say that, Doctor Carrier, because the Christ myth theory does not uh, in line of current scholarship yeah, I, at all. I, I, I don't I don't cite any ancient right. Guys, but what so, I'm saying is, guys, you just so. said we've got to deal with current scholarship yeah, when yeah. The, your whole project is way outside of the mainstream. So it's sort of yeah, odd I, to hear you say that. Not at all, because I, I base it on current scholarship. I show that even current scholarship supports the positions I hold. I don't actually rely on on Druze, for example, who is who's one of the best early mythicists. Um, I mention them, but I don't I don't rely on any of their work. I I double check and verify if I use anything they do. It's because I can independently verify it or it's been held up by modern scholarship. That's why we need to look at current scholarship and not go back 50, 100 years. All right. Do we want to take a, another caller? Yeah, do we no, have a caller? So we do. We do. Okay, very good. Uh, we have um, 4357. You're on the air with Unbelievers Radio. Who's this? Uh, this is Sean Taylor. I'm the one with the community. Oh, yeah. Cups, actually. <laughs> Hi, Sean. How's it going? <laughs> How are you, Richard? <laughs> So uh, my, my question is for the for the pastor, um, and, and this is something I discussed with Richard, but I wanted to hear the pastor's perspective on it. Um, for from my perspective, as as a, not a Christian, um, the history surrounding the subject is is very interesting. But whether or not there was an actual guy there really doesn't matter to me one way or the other. Uh, of course, it would to a Christian, but the fact that there. Um, you know, if, we, if for instance, if we could prove that uh, uh, Yeshua was walking around here at the time and saying some of these things, that's not what you, as a Christian, really rely on and believe in and, and love and so forth. It's his divine nature. It's his ability to do miracles. It's that he's God, um, is, is what I understand from the general Christian. 
Yeah, in the beginning but of the discussion. When we look said, at it from, from a scholarly perspective, like this the whole discussion has been, it really does I mean, none of this is touching the miracles or the divine nature. And this is certainly not something that is accepted uh, from a scholarly perspective or, or a, a real historian's perspective. I mean, no, no historian is saying, yeah, he, he certainly um, turned water into wine. I mean, I don't think that's a scholarly claim that's being made. And so that, that's my I wanted to get the pastor's perspective on while looking at this from a scholarly perspective to try to find if there really was a guy walking around on Earth named uh, later named Jesus. But none of this matches really what they believe about uh, the man. If you remember in the beginning when I was saying why I find the Gospels reliable, I said uh, they can give you historicity plus. I said I don't argue for a bare-bones, minimal historicity position. That's not what I'm going for like some of the other dudes that you've debated. And I understand uh, what that makes the audience think of me or not, but, but I'm not going to deny that truth. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is you just did, and that's okay, but you just jumped into metaphysics. So you're asking different questions now. You're, not, you're asking about what's possible because if if you have a different background and your understanding of your worldview and framework you have a different set of things first of all the, uh, the the way you think reality is constructed and the types of things that you think are possible in this environment and so you're jumping to a different set of questions than merely historiography that's what i would say there or we'll be I, having a different discussion i think i i think i didn't explain my question correctly um Yes, these these are are different topics. My point is, you're using arguments from from scholars and historians, and historical methods that are used to try and tease out whether or not there really was an actual earthly Jesus. I'm not doing that. And um, I want to make sure we can uh, get to uh, some additional questions. I don't mean to be rude or interrupt, um, but uh, could you restate, try to reframe the question more concisely? I approach it from a different way, yeah. Sean. I, I don't approach it from the way you're saying, actually. Okay. Yeah, I think I think what um, what he's saying though is that um, you start from the premise that God exists first of all. True so, that. And can do shit like that, right? So, True that. TV fourteen. Um, so that's TV a, fourteen. That's a, that's a different. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Finally, someone other than me. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's better to have the conversation honest. So yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, um, so I, I understand that perspective. Like, if if you already start from that perspective, although that creates the additional historiographical problem as to why that doesn't validate miracles in other religious traditions. I, I'm just curious as to like why why then if 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 you accept the premise that God exists and miracles can actually happen, why are not other historical reports of miracles true? Like why why couldn't it be true? That when Herodotus says a bunch of fish got resurrected and, and flopped around after they were cooked, um, why couldn't that actually be something that God did? I, I'm just curious. And uh, thank you for your, uh, your yeah. call, Sean. We appreciate the question. Right, take care. Cheers. I hope I wasn't mean, Sean. You seem like a cool dude. He is a cool dude, yeah. <laughs> I actually understand what he's saying. I think we'd have to talk more like on, yeah. a, on the side to have a longer thing because I, I would be able to understand what he's saying. And right. I would give him answers. I'm not saying they'd be satisfactory to him, sure. but I'd be able to explain my position to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Do we interact with what he said or move on to another one? Are you guys ready for another question? I'm ready yeah, for sure. another question. Uh, give me a sec, Forrest. Uh, are we having more uh, switching connections again? Well, uh -oh. I can say uh, a bit before you jump to the next question. No, you're, okay. One okay. is, I, I, I do believe it's possible to have false miracles, Dr. Carrier. That'd mm. be one thing. The other thing is How that, do you tell them apart, though? Uh, uh, there's a few things. So we don't just have historical events, but when we're looking at Scripture, for example, uh, we have sort of interpretation of events. So, for example, tons of people are crucified. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't actually really make it special that Jesus crucified. What makes it special, in a sense, is the divinely authenticated interpretation of the meaning. And so what I mean is it's not just the event itself, it's what it means and what God is doing. And so that would go for the miracles. And here's what's interesting. When you match up the Old Testament understanding of the character of God, the nature of God, and what his plan for redemption is, you know, going all the way back to, to Yahweh before, with Abraham— you see that there's intentionality and purpose there. So the miracles in the New Testament, in the Bible in general, are, are often, not always, because there could be overlap, different in the nature and scope and sort of rationale for them. For example, uh, helping people. Uh, it's not merely just to show off. In fact, Jesus 
Jesus bucked against that type of thing and said a wicked generation seeks a sign. So he wasn't trying to uh, just do frivolous things to be like, check out my skills, homie. He was trying to actually, there was reasons why. Yeah, right. And it was, and it, he would even exegete his miracle. He would say, if this is happening, you know the kingdom of God is among you. And so New Testament scholars talk about that, about, about that, the you end breaking what, of the kingdom I into know, the this, first this century. This gets into theology, though, but, but you know You can what, never what, separate it. Your you, theology is but all in back of your historiography, well, and I'm sure here you we go. go that. Here we go, because yeah. uh, if you wanted to prove the kingdom of God was breaking into the world, you wouldn't just cure a few random people. You would cure the disease. Like when Jesus came, he didn't just cure cholera, like all cholera. Yeah, so that would be divine. So you, I'm sure you know the phrase. Uh, what you're saying? There's a, so there's. A I mean, tr- otherwise it's just a Benny Hinn act, right? Well, I don't agree with that because I don't think Benny Hinn ain't doing nothing. Other than, <laughs> and, and, but, well, but that's what people claim, right? But but actually, so there's a truth to what there are gospels of Benny Hinn. There's a truth to what you're saying because check it out. Even if Lazarus rises from the dead, he still dies again, doesn't he? And so here's the thing. That's where you have the suffering servant and the reigning ruler or the reigning king. Yeah. Jesus is a lot of coming. theological presuppositions there. But you, I agree. But I don't yeah. deny it all. But here's yeah. what I'm saying: is it's much better. In my opinion, now I've heard you say I don't care what fundamentalists think. Most evangelicals, especially the reform type, don't call themselves fundamentalists. I understand atheists kind of lump it together. Okay, mm-hmm. you say they don't care what they think. Well, it's biblical it's literalism better. or inerrancy, either of those doctrines. Sure, I think it's better when debates are a little more naked, and I don't. I don't think you can separate the historiography out from your philosophical, your medical School theological oh, yeah, background. Yeah. And so I just won't act like that's what yeah, I'm yeah. doing. No, I'm not. I, and I, I, I respect that. So it is theological, but mm-hmm. I don't deny that. But yeah, yeah. But we just need to make sure the audience is clear on that. I've t- I've yeah. Hopefully, I've been very no, no, clear we about that. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> but I would say it's the same for someone else. And if like we had time, I know we're going to take questions. I would like to try to do some critique of your background philosophy, and it'd be oh, interesting. Oh yeah, but see, that would be a whole different show. Right? Not exactly, because it, 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 it ask all kinds of questions about how your philosophy relates to history. For example, we make value judgments about history. You got to use a standard to determine that you, to, to make mm-hmm. to do historical investigation. You have to assume your senses work. You have to assume know, rationality right? of humanity. No, that's literally a whole other show. You you are right. You are right. Yeah. <laughs> Let me stop. But to me, that's interesting, and that's yeah. that's sort of the Which, background. By the way, I'll say I would love to come back another time if you guys want to fly me out <laughs> to do in studio to talk about that stuff, right? So you would talk to me again? It's, it's, yes. Oh, right. no, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, and this kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. We to- yeah, that would just do just not history, but just do philosophy, like like epistemology, metaphysics. I'm, yeah, yeah, let's I'm do that. I'm glad to clear that because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm still in the minors, and I would consider okay. you in the majors. <laughs> and so no, I appreciate I, I would, that. No, I would love that. No, that would be fun. I like how you said the majors and put, like, your hand over Andre. <laughs> <laughs> we literally have people going, why does your audio keep cutting out? Right. <laughs> well, I, I actually was met have for we saw him. That? I was oh, going... Really? Like, you guys are also the same minor li- I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding, never mind. How are we you doing are, for to How are we doing for internet reliability oh, right now? Um, yeah. It's appalling. Um, okay. I have to keep switching between the two connections because um, Cox Communications seems to be having some service issues. That's your oh, we'll provider. So, we'll yeah, sure, yeah, so but so that right. Otherwise, no, that's good. Send your emails to why do we pay you at Cox Communications? <laughs> That's, That's a shame. I mean, Cheryl Moores has her holy hand grenade of Antioch on hand in case we need it. So. All right. Yeah. Uh, ready for another question? Feast on the orangutans. Cool. So <laughs> this one's from Roy, and it's uh, for you, Dr. Carrier. Why does Paul say the crucifixion is, quote, folly for the Greeks? Uh, weren't they used to demigods uh, that underwent a passion to achieve victory over death? Wouldn't crucifixion be folly? Uh, no, would crucifixion be folly when compared to something like the labors of Hercules? Right. Um, well, first of all, he says only to some Greeks, and then he goes on and says other Greeks are fine with it. Um, so so let's get that correct. But also the the Greeks had tons of these kinds of guys, right? I mean, Attis is an example, the, the success of the Attis cult where he castrated himself and died. Um, so here, here's this god that they worshipped who fits that model. Um, but also the uh, the Inanna cult, which um, was the, the the whole – it was in being worshipped in the city of Tyre when Jesus, according to the Gospels, went in to Tyre, right? At that same time, that temple cult was there where we have the goddess Inanna descending to hell, being struck and dead by, stricken dead by a death spell, and her naked body is nailed up – corpse is nailed up, and then her minions come down and feed her the food and water of life, and she's resurrected three days later. 
Um, so th this was a familiar story that was widely worshipped. Um, there were Greeks who thought these things were ridiculous. There were Greeks who thought the Inanna story was ridiculous, right? Um, but there were also Greeks who totally thought it was awesome and were actually adherents of the cult. Uh, so there isn't anything different about Christianity in that respect. Like there were people who rejected it because they thought it was absurd. And there were people who, who found something beautiful in it and worshipped it. And that was true for a lot of these different religions. Christianity just fits into that mold as well. Uh, did you have something you want to comment on there? Well, I would say that if you do a brief study of the earliest critics of Christianity, so like pagan Romans, for example, even Greeks, you see that they didn't think crucifixion was such a great idea. I mean, they mocked it. They thought it was ridiculous that you Yeah, could, well, they didn't recognize Jesus say, as a hero, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, they, they, you have they thought, to accept that premise first. And, and, and within the Jewish structure, um, it's true that they could have someone get killed by the Romans and still think of them as cool. I mean, just look Literally at Literally crucified. Just look at first and second yeah. Maccabeans. However... Mm -hmm. Not the Messiah. And a good way to see that is read Justin Martyr's dialogue with, yeah, with the tribe of the Jew. That's not in the Talmud, read, though. The Talmud's the other way around. Read right? Justin Martyr's dialogue, for example, with tribe of the Jew. He's yeah, like, Justin Martyr's he's not like, a Jew. He's like, but Trifo is, and he's like, no, Trifo is a character that Justin made up. Oh, well, you, you don't, you don't have evidence for that. And in fact, <laughs> no, he, but it's it's not a Jewish source. He, he you does can't, give. You can't say this Christian came along. Well, I met this Jew, and he said this thing, and then that's a Jewish source. No, it's for not. example, he's, you look at an actual Jewish source. You're looking at the Talmud, right? He's like, yo, I mean, well, I mean, Justin's actually closer than most of the Talmud, even in the time but frame. That, that's not relevant. The Talmud is an actual Jewish source. That's relevant. Okay, so we, we actually have no Jewish sources, like none, no source from a Jew saying that. The, crucifi the crucifixion of Jesus was a problem. Nobody, like, no Jewish source. Well, of, 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 uh, okay, of course you do, because see, you're not counting the New Testament documents as Jewish sources. Well, but, those are Christians, uh, but they're not Jewish. No, but they're not the Gospels. Maybe Gospel of Matthew, but that's their okay. only. So but that that, that is a Jewish source. Yeah, and there are Jews in there who believe it. And so, are, are, he also has Jews in there. That, that doesn't prove anything. And he has Jews in there mocking the crucifixion. But that's the point. We have but I some who even, thought it was ridiculous, some who didn't. But not only do you have guys yeah. like Kelsis and, and other pagan critics who are like, what are you guys believing in? On the Jewish side, Trifo the Jew gives a very common attitude. He's like, look, we know there might have to be some we suffering, don't, we don't but know not that. crucifixion. Show me in the Old Testament, basically, Justin, where you got it in the Old Testament. Yeah, but then we look at the Talmud where it's just assumed as a matter of course that the, the Messiah the, is going to be killed, and then he's going to be resurrected by is, the second Messiah. Here's what is it assumed as a matter of course in the Talmud Well, it's that, not treated that as he'll something... be crucified and, and that that's what's going to happen to the Messiah. Well, he'll, he'll be, be defeated. He'll be killed. And right. he has to be resurrected by a second Messiah. Okay, again, so the, how can that have to do with messianic expectations? when it's way over here on the chronological time also, frame. But we have that in Daniel. The, the Messiah is going to die. It says Dan, you know, in Daniel 9, it does, Messiah will be killed. Yeah, but you've, I mean, you've got, and then the end of the world I will mean, come. So do you, uh, do you assume the Son of Man is also the Messiah? Or no, no, it says the Messiah will be killed, the Christos. Okay, well, of course. Mes Messiah in, so, the, in the original language. So in Hebrew is what we'd have to go to, but... Well, but, Aramaic, but yeah. All right, so Daniel what? 9. Daniel 9. So. 9, 20, somewhere between 25 and 27. Do you guys have another question, or do you want me to spend time going to this? Because I, I was going to look at it. Questions, but if you're <laughs> this is oh, how many more do we have, by the way? Um, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Holy crap. I like the count. Okay. Eight questions. More. <laughs> eight, eight more. Eight more okay, all right. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. So I, I think what's, what's good is this is why, you know, Michael Brown, for example, who is a Jewish Christian, makes the argument that if you don't have Jesus as the Messiah— then you do have failed biblical prophecy because of the timing of this does show the death of the Messiah. But that is different. Daniel's prediction is different than actual on the ground, sandals on the ground, as it were, Jewish messianic expectation in the first century. You can't Only find some. them thinking this is what was going to happen. In fact, even within you, the you Gospels. You can't prove that that's all Jews thought that. Though. It, no, I mean, whoever wrote Daniel, who no, was a Jew, look, clearly not, believed that it was possible for the Messiah to die and herald the end of the world. Nobody thinks all Jews think anything. Well, yeah, I that's mean, that's my point. We all understand. That's my point. <laughs> like, we all understand variegation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I'm talking about is the general consensus of messianic expectation is yeah. not that he's going to die at the hands of the Romans. You just don't find that. No, you no, find no, the you, opposite. You saw, even the disciples. Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're asking that still after the resurrection. They still think that Jesus' plan is to yeah, restore the kingdom to Israel. But you're talking about some Jews, not all Jews, right? I would never say all Jews yeah, believe yeah. anything. That's but foolish. It, but There's too much variegation. The, Judea didn't become Christian, so of course obvious, not. Yeah, obviously. So, but it so began. They thought it was. But ridiculous. it began in Jerusalem. But some, yeah, some people bought into it. Most did not. 
Yeah, that's that's demonstrably the case. But I don't, I don't, I don't disagree yeah, yeah. with that. Well, so yeah, so we can't use that as an argument for but, anything. But you can't say it's because they knew that the Messiah was going to die, though. No, no, but but the point is, is that it was something that could be sold as a Jewish idea, and there were Jews who bought into it. We know this from the Talmud. We know this from Daniel. I'm curious why why the verb sold or uh, why employ <laughs> why employ that? Because what would you be gaining from the product you would buy in first century Jerusalem if you convert oh, well, to Christianity? That's Hebrews nine. You don't need the temple cult anymore. The sacrifice of Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice that eliminates all sin forever. You do not have to have the Yom Kippur. You don't need the Passover. You don't also, need the temple cult. You can just get out of all the temple stuff. So that's, that's right. why you want to do it. So it's it's a lazy Full Jew. On. It's it's a lazy Jew's religion. Well, that that's pejorative, right? But no, that's uh, literally the I case. Mean, yes. You don't need the temple. <laughs> I'm just saying that's they not, did not. Well, we see this in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They did not like the temple cult uh, because they thought it was corrupted. Yes, they, 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 so they wanted they, to replace they, it. They were extremely what religious. better to replace it than a dying Messiah who fits this whole dying rising God motif. The teacher of righteousness that solves all your problems. It solves all their problems. Yeah, and it's funny. Even if you look, it gives you, them eternal you, salvation you without the temple cult. You mentioned the Dead that's Sea. That's exactly folks. what they wanted. You mentioned the Dead Sea folks. They've got this battle between the sons of light and sons of darkness. Mm-hmm. And they don't think dude's gonna die. They think dude's gonna come well, back and mop up. Melchizedek, eleven Q thirteen. It looks like they're talking about. So a dying what's the Messiah battle between there. sons of lights and sons of darkness then? I, well, from eleven Q thirteen, they do actually say that the Messiah is going to die by citing Daniel in effect, and they're talking about this actual whole thing is being part of it and they actually tie that to isaiah 53 where the death of the chosen one of god will atone for all sins here, this is an 11 q 13 the thing, pre-christian though. jewish document here's the thing though i i there's a there's this big part of me that loves Talk about what, nerding out that <laughs> loves what you're saying because it's sort of you're almost giving a a messianic uh Messianic apologetic. It is true that Jesus fulfilled prophecy, but it's not true that first century Jews thought the way the biblical text pointed in regards to Messiah. That's all I'm saying. I don't know how long you're going to go with Unless that's what 11Q13 says, uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, yeah. So next question might have related to something. <laughs> okay. Before, all right. Before Very good. I stepped out of the room to go figure out exactly what was going on with our internet connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, reset the router, unplugged board. the other two routers. So plugged them back in. So hopefully we're up and running again. Looks like everything's cool. Uh, and I'm keeping my fingers crossed and hoping we still have <laughs> listeners. Uh, so, uh, but we should be ready to roll for the rest of the debate. So all right. Very go good. All right, All right, let's do it. So this kind of touches on something you guys touched on somewhere. Oh, sorry. Oh, we actually added like 20 listeners. <laughs> All right, sweet. Yeah. Um, so this is from Jennifer. She says, I read recently that some historians have found that Jesus was more attempting to reform Judaism, not create like a new religion. Is there any validity to that kind of assessment? So I'm guessing that's like aimed at both you guys. So whoever yeah, I mean, there are he some scholars. He was the Martin Luther of his day. Yeah, there is. No, right. There, That's a valid point because there, there are... I mean, there's there's like twelve at least reconstructions of the historical Jesus that have been proposed um, and are defended today, and and that is one of them. Uh, so I think like even if the Jesus myth theory is false, then you got to look at the second tier of most likely theories, and that would be one of the the ones to consider. So uh, I think that's a plausible theory. I don't think it's the most probable, but that's only because of what I found in my book. But um, I don't think that's something that you should dismiss as impossible. So, I mean, I don't know if this is an interesting interesting take because I hate when people say, I have an interesting take on that, and it's not very interesting. <laughs> but I, I think it's an interesting take is that um, all, all um, scholarship that doesn't take the New Testament as seriously as it should, in my opinion. What I mean is they have to stratify it out and they use the, mm-hmm. the criteria that uh, I, I don't oh, actually sorry. necessarily disagree with you about a lot of what you say about some of the problems in the criteria. Mm-hmm. But my argument would be from a different place that once you try to stratify it out, the, basically the less trustworthy you teach it, the more kind of mess you get. So, I mean, oh, that's maybe, true. maybe there's 12 Jesuses that are defended. There could be more. There's all types of historical right, Jesus yeah. that are defended that are not really, in my opinion, complete portraits of who he is. Is because that is part of what I would say Jesus was about in a sense. But the problem is they're only taking some of the data from the New Testament. They don't they they ignore the other strata as they view it, and so mm-hmm. they've got that aspect of Jesus. So they would look at things like the temple cleansing or some of the hypocrisy, things like that, and they would say, "Here's what you've got." 
But I mean, if you're Reza Aslan is a classic example of what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so who, zealot. Who, yeah, who conveniently ignores all the evidence against his hypothesis and then picks the evidence that supports it. Reza Aslan <laughs> seems to do that with a lot of things. Yes, bro. <laughs> just uh, granted. Uh, we'll but, go to the next question, but just but like, it's, it's satisfying. I mean, I want to point out that it does validate what he's saying. Interesting anecdote. So I'm at Talbot right now under uh, actually Dr. Moreland and uh, Garrett Deweese. Moreland is still teaching. I didn't know. It's, it's, he's, he's he's no, towards the end. Okay. He's, he's, you can you can. <laughs> I don't mean intellectually. No, no, but. He's, he's close yeah, to he's retiring, is yeah, what you mean. Yeah, They're yeah, trying yeah. to convince him to stick around for yeah, a little bit more, which I think yeah. he's going to do. But but I'm over there, and um, and there's a dude in the class I really like, and we started talking one day, and he's like, yeah, my brother-in-law. And he started saying things about his brother-in-law. I was like, wait, what? This dude that's at Talbot with me at the School of Theology, his brother-in-law is Reza Aslan. And so I know all these like personal like things about him, <laughs> which basically, let me just tell you this. Wait, the, did he go to Talbot? No, not no, no, Reza. Okay. No, but so his brother-in-law okay. is there. And did. so okay. just so I'm not saying anything bad, like yeah, yeah. basically – all he talks about is how generous he is and how nice he is. And, you know, obviously they disagree, yeah, but just that he's yeah, a really uh, nice guy and really generous and a, a sweetheart and kind of a rock star and all this stuff, right, you know? Yeah. He but, comes across that way. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll grant that. Like when he debates some of these Christians or reporters and he just, on presentation, he just, even on just like his personality, he beats them so bad just because he seems like so much nicer than them. Right. And, then you, and then you look at what he says. Yeah. Gender equality in Indonesia, but you know what about virginity? <laughs> for <Indonesia? laughs> yeah, there are issues. Sorry there. about that rabbit trail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, right. told me that we could only do one more. Wait, question. not last last question. Uh, oh, time wise. Yeah, time wise. Gotcha. So, so pick one, time? pick the best one of the ones that are left. Yeah. So I'm going to pick the one that is direct. We have one left for both of you. Okay. So I'm just going to be sure. That keeps it a little bit more. Sweet. Fair. Yeah. Um, and it kind of goes into this whole thing. Um, can we do two more questions? Because it ties into. Do it, do it, go, go, go. Yeah. Let's do see what we can do. Two more questions. Yeah. It's going to tie it into what you guys were talking about. about we're not going like, to run into any other shows. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> well like, frankly, I mean, if we're willing, internet. we're willing to just not do closings because I don't, I don't need to do closing. I don't need a closing, but I'd like. But if you're down, if because the clo- the thing is, who was Jesus? I have a rap about who is Jesus. We can do. We could totally we can close on like that. Close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because everybody else like if you want to know my thesis and all that stuff, my book is out there. You can get it. So, so I, your I don't. Closing will be the story, and then we'll yes, that yes, the completely unrelated <laughs> story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, man. No, that's that's brilliant. I like that. That's I'm, perfect. Because yeah, yeah. All right, so two more questions, story, and then wrap. <laughs> It shows. It shows out without the internet, we're literally just the blind leading the blind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, talks about that. About that's so a huge worry is that the internet went out for a week, civilization would fall. Yeah. But um, so this question is from Cheryl, and it kind of ties in what you're saying about and you guys are talking about the multiple historical Jesus. Mm-hmm. She says, "Why do we only need to make it so that there's one Jesus? Why not just have? I mean, a bunch of people have the name Yeshua or Joshua. Why can't we kind of look at it like there's a bunch of guys who kind of to get were formed together." to make this Jesus in the Gospels, but historically there's multiple people to fill the role. Well, our pastor here would not accept that. What do you think I would say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, serious. It's all right. I mean, if you had to say well, it... Well, no, obviously we're... you're not going to say that the Gospel Jesus is an amalgam of a variety of different Jesuses. Right. Um, uh, so I know your answer to that. Uh, my answer to that is... But is I that... might employ some shaving, <laughs> as in oh. Occam's razor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my explanation would be like like theoretically possibly you could explain the gospels as that. Um, and, and I give an example in in my book where uh, Jesus Ben Ananias, who was killed at, during the siege of Jerusalem, there seems to be elements of his story that were used as a skeleton or as a model for Mark to to write the crucifixion narrative of Jesus. Yeah, you can make a good case of that. Many scholars have suggested this, um, but that doesn't explain the origins of Christianity because Christianity predates gospel of mark by you know 40 years so so it's we got to look back at the letters of paul does that make sense of the letters of paul and so the amalgam theory doesn't make sense of the origins of christianity it it could work for the gospels but that that requires argument requires evidence and so on so so it's plausible for the gospels but i'm more interested in why did christianity begin how did it begin and 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 that's a harder question to answer I mean, I might say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. <laughs> Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there are many, there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many, and it's uh, sometimes put in quotation marks, gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom, all th- from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom 
uh, are all things and through whom we exist. I would say that, but I'll say I do actually think Oxen, Oxen's Razor is good there. The the sort of what and the other thing is we say we just want some evidence. Like if yeah. that's it's that if that's the best way to explain Jesus, we want to say okay, why? Yeah, you need evidence of it. I agree with that, and and I think. It's possible there could be evidence for that, but you guys are doing a really good job of mentioning things that I can tie into the next. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you for helping me with. So you mentioned that uh, in your understanding, the Gospel of Mark uh, comes about forty years after maybe mm-hmm. the inception of Christianity. So um, Roy again asked, um, we seem to accept oral tradition uh, for some kind of, for some historical events. Why can't we apply oral tradition to the validity of the Gospels? Right. Um, and then, Okay, yeah, he'll he'll have his own take, and which will be very different from mine, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I do discuss this in the book. Uh, in particular, there's the examples. There have been other examples of people trying to say, well, oral tradition is reliable, and here's this case study that shows it. And then someone else coming along and actually actually examine the case study and say, actually, your example shows the opposite, that people – oral tradition is extremely malleable. It changes very rapidly. It gets added very rapidly. The thing, people will distort oral tradition very easily – to fit the things that they want to be true. Uh, And the problem with oral tradition is, especially 40 years, which, by the way, is almost a human life, an average human lifetime back then, the average lifespan for an adult. If you survived childhood, you could expect 50% chance of surviving to 48. Um, So 40 years is a long time back then. Uh, But we look at, for example, I usually give the example in the book of the Roswell myth, which was only 30 years or roughly 40 years, close to, where we went from finding tinfoil and sticks in the desert to finding an entire flying saucer with bodies of aliens that were autopsied by the government. So, you know, oral, so-called oral tradition can distort very quickly. Um, So there are problems with there. So, So you can't just assume oral tradition is reliable. Or you can't necessarily assume that it's unreliable. You have to have evidence to back it up, and that's problematic. And so then you have to get into whose oral tradition, which part is oral tradition, and so on. And that's a problem. But also I have to point out in my book in Chapter 10, where I talk about the Gospels, a lot of the stories in there are literary constructs in the sense that they follow the patterns and models by which people who went to Greek school, who learned how to write and compose stories in Greek, that they were taught how to write stories, it fits those models of how you did that. It does not fit any model of oral tradition and and oral transmission. So it looks like what they're doing is composing literary models and literary stories based on the way they were taught to do so in school, not reflecting oral tradition. Now, that doesn't in and of itself prove that they aren't basing some of it on oral tradition. It just means you need evidence for the oral tradition before you do that. I think it'd be a mistake to uh, put all of your wait for the accuracy of the New Testament upon oral tradition uh, because some of those things he talked about are true. Uh, So then there's other questions I would want to ask. For example, uh, when you said whose oral tradition, I would ask what's the culture sort of of Judaism within Palestine. I would say it's more amenable to retaining proper memories of Jesus. However, there will be, uh, I wouldn't deny this either, and and, uh, I don't know why Christians try to act like this is not part of their reasoning, but it is, the sovereignty of God, meaning if God is communicating, if he is exegeting himself through Jesus, uh, then then right. there's going to be what I might call an, an architect to the process, meaning it's very human. So it's, I'm, not, I'm not talking about some divine mm-hmm. voice from heaven, and then they write it down, and then they make sure no one makes a mistake. That's not what I mean. Yeah, what if I mean you grant is, that premise, you can get to where you are, right? Yeah, well, I, yeah. that's true, but I, do, I would say there's sort of what uh, I might call secondary evidence as well. And that's why I mentioned, for example, the culture of, of first century Judaism. But it'd be a mistake to put everything on that. I do mm-hmm. think that'd be a mistake. And I would even say you can see that about some of the later traditions that sprung up about, about Jesus within Judaism itself weren't really accurate. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but also even the language of the New Testament itself uh, shows a care and a concern. And so, I mean, you know this now. You do different things with it, but you mm-hmm. know, there's pre-Pauline yeah. uh, creeds. Uh, these fragments, Philippians two, Philippians two. Uh, most people say First Corinthians fifteen that are in there. Yeah. And I would say right. that you have a preservation and uh, you have Aramaic sometimes in there, such as Cephas, which seems to ask the question, yes. where do you have an Aramaic-speaking Christian church? Okay, that's Jerusalem. So there's mm-hmm. some antiquity to the creed. Now, mm-hmm. actually, that in and of itself doesn't dedicate, doesn't automatically ensure its correctness. That's why I mentioned yeah, other yeah. things as well. 
you couldn't just put it on oral tradition. But the early Christians did value it. I don't agree that that they were okay with forgeries. I don't agree that they. Um, I'm not saying you said that, but I'm saying mm-hmm. others no, have said I know that. What you mean. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you look, you have actually early Christians removing other Christians. Like, like one guy found out the guy wrote a forged version of 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 a version of he called it Acts. It was like almost it was like the, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. Yeah, we we have an account. The of dude, that, the yeah. dude got removed. He's like, oh, I'm trying to honor his name. He's like, dude, you're out of here. That ain't cool. And we have other examples where we have people not being okay with forgeries. My point is. Christians valued the eyewitness testimony and tradition. Richard yeah. Balcom's book is This ties into good. what you said before about reading other scholars. Bart Ehrman's book, Forged, mm-hmm. I highly recommend. He wrote like the scholarly version, like this detailed footnoted version of that is Forgery and Counterforgery, um, which is also excellent. So if you really want to follow up on this and the whole, all aspects of it, those are, those are the, the books to get. The one is for, like for colloquial. The other is like the scholarly version. I highly recommend them. Yeah, in that, I mean, he says, look... Uh, no, it's not true that it was okay to just have forgeries back then. Like sometimes you hear people say that, it's not the case. But I would say you could see the early Christians uh, agreed with that. Uh, and then lastly, you just see Paul employing tradition terminology. He's got a Pharisaical background. He's got a, a background in in Judaism. Romans sixteen seventeen, First Corinthians eleven twenty three, Philippians four nine, First Thessalonians two thirteen. He talks about learning, receiving, holding on to tradi- traditions which you received. So uh, there, I, I guess I say that in part is a, a way to disagree with what it seems like you think early Christian epistemology is, which is uh, mm-hmm. secret codes and scriptures and uh, imaginary hallucinations. Well, none of that contradicts that, though. Well, so that's yeah. really the dis- yeah. disagreement. <laughs> but but I would, but that's that's some of what I would say. I would never stake reliability of gospels merely on the fact that it was orally transcribed, even within the culture it was. However, it's important to consider. <clears throat> This yeah. has been a really awesome yeah. conversation, and I'm sure like there's parts of it that like two percent of our audience base will get. But, like, <laughs> there's parts of it that I'm like, okay, those are words. <laughs> I can recognize them as words, but what they mean, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, well, we've only touched the tip of every iceberg on this, so for sure.